Yeah, church, we're starting a brand new series this morning on Psalm 23, which I think a lot of people would say is probably the most famous psalm of all the psalms in the Bible. And we are, it's only six verses long, but we are going to spend the next three weeks going through Psalm 23 a little bit at a time because there is so much truth crammed into Psalm 23. And it is incredible. Uh, My name is Matt. I serve on the pastoral team here at ACC. I love right now, can I just say, I look out and I see this room just packed with people and it makes my heart glad. Can I just, can I say that real quick? You know, about that, let me, let me just throw this out there too. On uh, Easter Sunday, this uh, is going to be even crazier. So if you are normally a, a, 10, a 10 o'clock service person and you would consider maybe doing the early service or the 1 o'clock service, uh, just start thinking about that now. You have a few weeks, uh, about a month to think through it. That would be awesome to free up some seats in this, uh, in this service. Anyway, Psalm 23. It is a psalm all about the goodness of God. And watch this. I, I know that in church, there's certain things that I can say that, that people who have been in church just a little bit of time will respond back to me. If I say this, God is good all the time, right? Just a little bit of time in church and you realize that when the pastor says God is good, you're supposed to say all the time. And it's, it's something that we say because we know we're supposed to say it. But you know that, that sometimes we can all admit that there's moments in our lives where we really struggle to believe that. Those moments in our lives where things aren't going quite how you planned, things aren't going the way you hoped, something happens, it catches you off guard. And in those moments of your life, you're thinking, wait, is God always good to me? And I believe as we look at Psalm 23 because it is a psalm all about the goodness of God, whether you are in green pastures or in the dark valleys, it is, it is a psalm about the goodness of God all throughout your life. You know what I'm really bummed about in Psalm 23 is that we usually only hear Psalm 23 at funerals. But do you know that the, the psalm ends with this phrase, all the days of my life. In other words, this is a psalm that David wrote for us to encourage us, not just uh, when someone has passed away, but during the entire span of our life. It's something that there is so much incredible truth. And we're going to explore that together. We're going to take a couple verses today. We're going to take a couple verses next week and a couple verses the week after that. And then we are going to get into our Don't Be Fooled series. Uh, It's going to be an awesome time. Let's pray together that God would bless uh, the reading of his word and, and, and my teaching it. God, I ask right now that as we read your word together and as you give me an opportunity to try to put some some truth behind it and to teach what what it is that you're trying to, to tell us, God, I pray that every person in this room would hear something from you. We each probably need to hear something maybe a little different, but we ask that your spirit would be uh, working and teaching and that our ears would be open and that you would be working in us. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Go ahead and grab your Bible and let's turn to Psalm 23. We are going to read the entire psalm together. In fact, we're going to do that every Sunday for the next uh, three weeks. Uh, Hopefully, you can take this psalm and be reading it at home over and over again. It's only six verses long, so we should be able to memorize it together. Whatever version you want to memorize out of is great. But six verses long, Psalm 23. If you are new to the Bible, do you know how you find the book of Psalm? The book of Psalms, just open it up in the middle. There you go. And you're probably uh, in in Psalms. And we're going to be at Psalm 23, which is on page 331, if you're using the same Bible I am. All right. Let's read it together. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. 
My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. We read this and we have this this metaphor that immediately pops out. The very first verse. The Lord is my shepherd. So we have this, this metaphor. The Lord as a shepherd and David or you and I... As sheep. And I think this is where, uh, as I've studied Psalms and just uh, the way shepherds and actual sheep interact with each other and the truth of each, uh, it's such an incredible way to describe our relationship with God. And I'm hoping that today, as as I explain a few things in just these first couple of verses, you can see that there is no accident in God calling us sheep. That that was a perfect way to describe us in relationship to to him. And one of the first questions we have to ask is, what is a shepherd? What does a shepherd do? Shepherds really kind of meet, uh, they they have three things I think they do. They, uh, they, They feed, right? They feed and they lead and they meet needs. Rhymes, so we can remember that, right? They they feed and they lead and they meet needs. A shepherd does this for its sheep. And so, if you ever wondered, am I a shepherd? If you ever wonder, are you a shepherd? Uh, moms and dads, guess what? You feed and you lead and you meet needs of your children. Hopefully, you've been called to shepherd your family. You know, the, the word pastor. If you look at it in Greek and figure out what another word for it, it's the same word where we get the word shepherd. In other words, my job is the job of a shepherd, not of, of literal sheep, thank goodness. I know nothing about them other than what I've studied, but of, of a flock of this sheep. You know, as pastors in a church, we're called to feed and lead and to meet needs. Maybe you're a life group leader. Your job is to, to feed and lead and meet needs. We're all called to shepherd That's what a shepherd does. And and an incredible truth is that sheep require a shepherd. If you know anything about sheep, you know that they're probably the most helpless, defenseless, dumb animal in existence. And the fact that God says, I'm going to use this animal, this animal that, that can't run away from anything very fast, doesn't have any claws, it doesn't have sharp teeth, nothing is afraid of a sheep. These things are sitting ducks unless there is a shepherd to protect them. Sheep are just completely defenseless. Sheep require a shepherd. Otherwise, they're toast. And a lot of us, we try to go through life without a shepherd leading us. And what we don't realize is that you require a shepherd. So if it's not the good shepherd of, the, of God leading you in your life... You're still being led by something, and I would, I would submit that that thing is the world. That you're submitting to the leadership of the world around you and letting it guide you and feed you. And that's not a good thing. John 10, 11 says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. We understand that there's no greater shepherd that we could have than God. And it's no wonder to me that we are compared to sheep. Uh, one of the things I did to study for this series is I read a, a, a book called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. And it was a book written by a guy named Philip Keller. And Philip is an actual shepherd who understands not only the Bible but understands how sheep interact with a shepherd. And just the truth that came from actually looking at a shepherd look at this psalm was mind-blowing. And what I hope to do today is share with you some of the cool things I found and why it's no surprise that David uh, writes like this. Here's one of the quotes from Philip Keller. It says, It is not an accident that God has chosen to call us sheep. The behavior of sheep and human beings is similar in many ways. Our mob instinct, our fears and timidity, our stubbornness and stupidity, our perverse habits are all parallels of profound importance. Man, I'm probably stepping on a lot of toes right now. Like, 
listen, if I'm calling you sheep, I, I fully, I'm two hands up. I'm a sheep too. And it says, yet despite these adverse characteristics, Christ chooses us. He buys us. He calls us by name, makes us his own, and delights in caring for us. This is the truth of a real shepherd talking about his sheep, but understanding that this is the way the good shepherd loves and talks and cares about us. And the the psalm opens up with this idea of the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. I have all that I need. This idea of not wanting, what it really does is it shows that David later on in his life as when he wrote this psalm, it was was in the point of his life where he'd experienced incredible joyous parts. He'd experienced uh, the, the deepest, darkest parts. He had experienced the full spectrum of what God can do. And yet he had a full confidence in that moment that the good shepherd through all of it was meeting his needs. It was this contentment in his life that the good shepherd has never left him wanting. And I've noticed in my own uh, uh, history with my kids that the word need and want to get confused a lot. Have you noticed that? My kids need a smartphone. I didn't know, you know, like need a smartphone, need, you know, we, we use this, these, these words, we, we, we think we understand what they're saying, but uh, need is a very relative term. To understand, like even in Scripture, you have gentlemen like Elijah or John the Baptist or even Jesus himself experienced in incredible moments in their lives where they, they seemed to have a lot of needs. They didn't seem to have a lot of worldly wealth and all these blessings pouring on them. And yet there was this confidence that all of their needs had been provided for. It was this contentment. Philippians 4.11 puts it this way. I am not saying this, this is Paul speaking, I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstance. The truth of this verse is that if, you are, if you've learned to be content no matter the circumstance, the word need doesn't really pop up anymore, does it? If you understand that everything you have in the good times and the bad... And you can be content in understanding that is exactly what the master, the good shepherd, has allotted for you at that moment. You don't use this word need because you understand that the good shepherd has taken care of you exactly the way you need to be taken care of. In other words, it's like understanding that you are completely satisfied with his management over your life. Even when things don't seem that great. I'm completely satisfied. I don't have any needs. I don't have any wants. The good shepherd knows what he's doing in my life. So as I was looking through this, these first couple of verses, I noticed in here in the, the first part of verse 2, and then the second part of verse 2, and the, th- the first part of verse 3, there are three things that I want to point out that the shepherd, a good shepherd, does for his sheep. And the three things I'll tell you now and then we'll talk through them. It, it's providing rest, providing refreshment, and providing restoration. A good shepherd understands the importance of rest, refreshment, and restoration. Let's talk about rest first. We see that at the beginning of verse 2. He lets me rest in green meadows. You know, we are terrible at resting we really, I'm talking like me too. I, this sermon is for me. In fact, I'm going to just preach for the next couple minutes to myself. If you need some rest, just lay your head down. You don't have to pay attention. <laughs> like we're terrible at rest. In fact, studies show that in America we get two hours less sleep right now than we did 50 years ago. We work ourselves ragged. We forgot what it means to be able to rest. And if you're wondering whether or not I'm talking to you, uh, think through some of these statements. Are you always in a hurry? Is your to-do list unrealistically long? Do you use days off to catch up on things you're behind on? Do people tell you to slow down? Do you feel guilty when you relax? When you sit down and put your feet up, does that make you feel guilty? Have you, do you have to be sick to get time off of work? 
Like if those things are true, you're probably uh, with me in that a lot of times we struggle to understand what it looks like to find rest. I want to make sure that this isn't a problem in my family and in my, my ministry and in my marriage So early on, I told our overseers that if I'm going to step up to this job as a lead pastor, I want to make sure we have some really firm boundaries. And one of the things we agreed to is I'm never going to work more than 45 hours a week. Which means if there's 50 hours worth of stuff to do, five of them aren't going to get done. And if that means I have to choose between cheating on my family uh, and my affection and my time or cheating on you guys, you're going to lose every time. But it's this, this, this agreement that I've made, like, hey, I want to make sure that I recognize the importance of, of the, the place that I get the most rest and refreshment and, and encouragement. Is that, that's at home with my, my family and my wife. So it's working in these boundaries in our lives of understanding that rest is something that's really important. Now, let me, let me tell you, uh, this, this shepherd, this actual shepherd who wrote this book, He shared four things that have to be true for an actual sheep to be able to lie down and rest. In other words, if if one of these things is off, the sheep will not be able to lay down and rest. And I think that there are some really cool parallels in this. So I want to share these four things with you. If you are struggling right now finding rest, here's the problem. It is not with the good shepherd. The good shepherd is providing all four of these things in your life. You just maybe aren't accepting these things that are being provided for you in your life. Let me show you these four things. It's fear, tension, aggravations, and hunger will keep us on our feet instead of allowing us to rest. This first one, let's talk talk about fear for a moment. Sheep are incredibly timid. They're amongst the most timid animals. Uh, they, They can be frightened by the smallest thing. Uh, the, the shepherd gave an example where one day he had his flock of sheep and he had some family friends coming to visit and they had just gotten a, a, a puppy, a little itty bitty, like five pound puppy. And that puppy jumped out of the car and barked one time at this entire flock of sheep and that sheep flock went running. That kind of timidity of understanding that this little thing, this five pound dog somehow is going to cause so much fear that they are unable to lie down. Instead, they hop up and start moving. And the crazy thing about sheep is that if only one of them gets afraid and pops up and starts running, the rest don't know why, but they get up and start running too. That is so like us, isn't it? Seriously, one person gets afraid and, or shares something or they write a blog about it or they post something on Facebook and all of a sudden, everyone's afraid. Don't eat whatever. Don't look at whatever. Don't whatever. I mean, we all just like, we love to just pass our fear on to each other. We love to be constantly anxious and afraid and worried. And when we find ourselves struggling with those types of things, guess what? We f- can't rest. We can't lie down. And we either have to recognize that we're going to live in that anxiety and fear or we're going to live in a sense of quiet rest. We have to pick which one. And I think the thing that makes a difference for us is a keen awareness of the good shepherd's presence. Because you know what else is true of sheep? When the shepherd is present, they're not afraid. Isn't that amazing? You got the sheep, and when the shepherd's there, that little dog yipping or whatever's coming, or they can lie down and rest because they are aware. They are keenly aware that the good shepherd is present. And when you and I can be aware in our lives that the good shepherd is there, that he's doing what he's supposed to be doing, that he is a good shepherd, we won't have to be afraid, and we can lie down and rest. In 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power. Psalm 4.8 says, In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Are you keenly aware of the presence of the Good Shepherd in your life? Another one of those things that keep the sheep from laying down is tension. 
You know, we've heard like with chickens, it's called the pecking order. With dogs, we have this concept of the alpha dog. With sheep, it's called the budding order. And it's ultimately every sheep in a herd understands who the boss is. And they understand who the second boss is and the third. And they all know where they fit into this order. And what happens with sheep is if they're doing their own thing, they're minding their own business, they're kind of eating their own little patch of grass, and some other sheep wants what they have and comes up and puts its head at the right way or does something with its legs or it's whatever, that sheep understands there's now tension between the two of us and I've got to get up and move because I don't fall in the same spot in this pecking order. And there's this tension that comes up with sheep that I believe also happens with you and I. When we constantly compare our standing or our status with people around us and we see what they have and what you don't or what you have and they don't and we're constantly comparing and, and, uh, and, and contrasting what we have with everyone else and we're trying to figure out who's better between us that causes a tension between us that keeps us constantly on our feet, constantly trying to one-up each other, constantly thinking about ourselves, unable to rest. And we need to knock that off. This, this shepherd said that when two sheep were in this kind of attention, the moment he would stand up and be visibly seen by these two sheep, they would both stop and go back on their own ways. They both, both go back doing their own thing. And here's a really cool truth I see in that. When my eyes are on the master, they are not on those around me. That is a place of peace. When we can take our eyes off of each other, instead put them where they belong on the good shepherd, you will find that you don't care about who's where and who's eating what. Another thing that keeps sheep from being able to lay down is aggravations. It's imagine bugs and gnats and things flying around and if a sheep is trying to rest and these things are happening, it'll get up and find some other place where it's not being aggravated. We're going to spend some time especially on week three, talking about aggravation. So I don't want to go too deep. But one thing I see in our, a parallel is an aggravation would be those things that distract us from keeping our eyes focused on Christ. The things that dis, you know, kind of pull our attention away. They are constantly wondering what's going on in our lives. There are these distractions. And uh, we also see in Scripture what, what a good shepherd does, by the way. A shepherd would go and anoint sheep with some sort of like repellent or oil. That would keep the bugs away so the sheep can rest. Just like Christ has done that to us, we see in Scripture this this symbolism often of the Holy Spirit being symbolically represented with oil. That the Good Shepherd has put uh, oil on us, has, has blessed us with His Holy Spirit. And when we have the Holy Spirit in us, we don't need to be aggravated by all the distractions around us. We don't have to be aggravated. We can lay down and rest. And the fourth thing that keeps a sheep from laying down is this thing called hunger. And what's really interesting here is in Palestine, where David wrote this psalm, it's known for not green, lush grass. It's known for being a dry wasteland. If a shepherd is a really good shepherd, it's going to take a lot of work of working the land, of tilling it and watering it, and planting it, and weeding it, and making sure that what is there is lush and green and able to be enjoyed by his flock. We have a good shepherd that has given you plenty to eat. Because what happens when you get hungry, when sheep get hungry, they wander and wander and wander as long as they're still hungry, trying to find something to munch on. We don't have to worry about that. God has given us plenty of truth and plenty of goodness to enjoy. So those are the four things that might be things that are are messing up your ability to rest. But again, I'm going to repeat this. God is answering all four of those things for you. You have no reason not to be able to lay down and rest. If there's a problem with one of those four things in your life, it's not with him. It's with your inability to recognize the Holy Spirit's leading in your life or you've taken your eyes off of the Good Shepherd or you're not keenly aware of His presence in your life. You should be able to rest. Here's the second thing. Not, not just rest, but I also want to talk about refreshment. We see in the second part of verse 2, it says, He leads me beside peaceful streams. He leads me beside peaceful streams. Sheep are very thirsty creatures. They're 70% water. 
70% of what makes up a sheep is, is actually water. And they can get dehydrated very quickly. And when a sheep gets dehydrated, it, it, it just it, it, it kind of messes it all up. I don't, I'm not a doctor. I don't know what happens. But it's, it, it's not good, okay? And the shepherd says that, that ultimately, if I, maybe I can just read my notes. It becomes weak and impoverished. And it takes a lot to bring it back to health. And if a sheep is very thirsty, what it will do is it will find something to drink, even if it's not good to drink. It will find a puddle. It will find a pothole. It will find something with water that's stagnant and been sitting there and something else happened in there but the sheep in front of it and, you know, whatever. And it will drink from that puddle if it's not led to pure, clean drinking water. And it says that a good shepherd leads me beside peaceful streams. It leads us to the water we so desperately need. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You see in uh, John seven thirty seven, it says, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Here's one thing I, I think both of those verses should show us is that everybody thirsts all of us have a thirst a longing in us where we are going to try to uh, basically satisfy that thirst somehow and some of us have learned in the incredible uh, the incredible truth that 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 longing that thirst the only way to really satisfy it is to to go to God to thirst uh, to, to to drink from the living water but what happens if you don't know that or you haven't recognized that or you have yet to be led to great drinking water, that you end up drinking from something that's not great. That, that shepherd we were talking about, Philip Keller, he says this, All the long and complex history of earth's religions, pagan worship, and human philosophy is bound up with this insatiable thirst for God. In other words, because all of us thirst... If that's not being satisfied, you're going to find yourself making up things. You're going to figure out a way to, to drink something in. And the best source, obviously, to be taking into your body is the, the truth. That shepherd had also pointed out another little tidbit from this book. That there's three sources of pure drinking water that you can lead your sheep to. There's three ways to take your sheep to clean water to drink. And one is the morning dew. The morning dew, I, I love the symbolism in this. It's having to, the, the, the wherewithal to wake up your sheep early enough in the morning where there's still water on the grass itself and to, to take them out before the sun's come up and evaporated all that away and to have them feed on that grass knowing that they're going to get some pure water. Does that remind us of something in our own lives? When you wake up every day and you say, I'm going to eat and I'm going to feed a little bit at a time and get a little bit of nourishment every day in my own personal quiet times. That's one way we can take in water a little bit at a time and we can, we can feed ourselves. Another way, uh, the second way that you can lead or get clean water for your sheep as a shepherd is, is through a well. Now, the interesting thing about a well is that sheep don't have the ability to get the water out of the well themselves. Somebody has to step in and draw that water up and give it to the sheep. And another, I think, really cool symbolism here of why uh, God is the good shepherd and we are the sheep is this idea of the well and our inability to get water out of the well is probably an, an example of Sunday mornings. It's, an, it's a, an opportunity where we get together and you, you allow someone else to draw some water up out of the well for you and, and put it in something that you can drink out of and say, hey, let's, let's drink from this well together every Sunday. Is that a cool opportunity we have on Sunday? So not only do we have this morning dew, it's our own personal quiet times. We have this water coming up out of the well that's, that's being fed or given to us uh, through Sunday mornings. But then you also have this idea of a peaceful stream. These springs or streams of water that a shepherd can lead a sheep to, can lead its herd to. 
And this, this idea of just an abundance of pure water to drink, to me, reminds me of, of intentional discipleship. It's being in, intentionally in relationships where you are just surrounded by truth and goodness to drink in. It's called things like life groups. Being involved in a life group where you just come and it's just this, this opportunity where not only are you you're feeding yourself, but there's just plenty to eat from and other people there eating with you, drinking with you. What a cool picture of this intentional discipleship of making sure that we have plenty to drink. You know what's crazy about sheep is a shepherd says that as you're leading a sheep to good drinking water, sheep will stop along the way. When they find a puddle and think, this is probably the best I'm going to get and stop to drink. And sometimes we do that. We understand that we have a source of incredibly awesome living pure water to drink. And we find ourselves constantly stopping along the path to drink filth. Galatians 5, 16 through 17 says, So I say... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. In other words, when you are being led to good water, choose that. Let's stop as followers of Christ stopping along the way and choosing constantly water that's not good for us. You know, when you drink that water, sometimes it doesn't do anything to you right then. Sometimes it's not until a week or two weeks later that the parasites set in and you find out all the consequences of what it was that you did. Let's not fall for that. Here's a third thing. So we have rest and we have refreshment. We also have restoration. We're going to look at the very first part of verse 3. It says, he renews my strength. He renews my strength. You may have another version that say, he restores my soul. Uh, that, that word, renew or restore, if you look at it, the, uh, the Greek word that was used in the original uh, text, uh, the, where else it was translated in scripture, the, the word that it's actually most translated into is the word return. In other words, I like to picture a boat. Imagine a boat that is trying to get from point A to point B and it's trying to be on course and somehow because of wind or a storm or something going on in the the life of that boat that that boat has gotten off course and now it's not headed where it's supposed to be headed. What we do with this idea of restoration or returning is to turn the boat, to return it to the point where it's facing in the right direction again, to get that boat right back on the right course. And a crazy implication from this is that he renews my strength, is that even while you are under the good shepherd's care, you are going to need restoration. You are going to get tired. You are going to have moments where you feel like you need your strength restored and renewed. Even when you are in the presence of the good shepherd, restoration is going to be necessary. One of the craziest things I learned about sheep this week Man, I've, I've never studied sheep like this ever. <laughs> Is there's a, a thing that happens to sheep. It's called being cast or being cast down. Sheep have so much mass on the top and their little legs have no mass to them at all that when a sheep finds itself uh, not just laying down but losing track while it's laying down and flipping too far up on its back, it's stuck. It just sits there and kicks its legs, has no ability, no, no way to get the, itself rolled back over. And sheep, this happens to them, it's called being cast. And when a sheep is cast and it's on its back and it's unable to help itself, if it stays that way for too long, it'll kill it. The way the blood flow, it kind of gets cut off and the way the body is trying to whatever, a sheep that is cast for too long will, will find itself dying. Isn't that just another incredible understanding? Why did David use this idea of sheep and shepherd? Because we are sheep, man. We find ourselves constantly in our lives cast down, don't we? We find ourselves stuck on our backs, kicking helplessly. And, and only 
When a good shepherd comes along and finds us on our back and loves us and wants us to be back on our feet, does a shepherd come and help a, a sheep that is cast and help to put it back on its feet? It's an incredible illustration of how God loves us. We often think, listen, when we fall and we find ourselves stuck on our backs, that God is just disgusted with us and wouldn't want anything to do with us. But when we understand that God doesn't treat his sheep like that, he's a good shepherd who understands that sheep find themselves on their back from time to time, he will come up to us and, and take a cast sheep and put that sheep back on its feet. And the crazy thing, too, is depending on how long that sheep has been cast, that process can take a minute. That can take a while. When that shepherd puts that sheep back on its feet, it's got to stay there and bear the weight a little bit because its legs are too weak in that moment to hold itself up. If it just lets go, you'll notice the sheep kind of stumbles and falls and falls back on its back. A good shepherd recognizes when you have fallen over. A good shepherd wants you on your feet and a good shepherd will go after the one and find you cast and spend some time with you to get you back on your feet. That is who the good shepherd is in your life and mine. We often have this picture of this one sheep that's, that's lost and the 99 that are with the shepherd. And we picture this one sheep as having wandered off. Now listen, I believe that sometimes... Most of the time, probably, that's what happens. We're, we're with the good shepherd and we find ourselves wandering off the path and the good shepherd comes back and grabs us still on our feet doing our own thing and brings us back into the fold. But do you know what I also think happens sometimes? That lost sheep isn't lost because it's wandered off. That lost sheep is lost because it's been cast on its back, unable to move. And the rest of the, the herd has gone ahead with the shepherd. So sometimes... When you find yourself that one lost sheep, it's not necessarily because you've gone crazy and you've gone and just like living in this, like you're just whatever, living in sin and you're doing all these things, you just don't care anymore. I think that happens sometimes, but sometimes, believer, what we find ourselves is you ask yourself and you're really honest with yourself, you're the exact same Christian you were a year ago. You've been cast on your back and the good shepherd is coming offering you I want to help you get back on your feet I want to help you catch up I want to help you move and grow and stick with the rest of the herd we want to be maturing together the good shepherd wants you on your feet check this out Psalm 56 13 says for you have rescued me from death you have kept my feet from slipping so now I can walk in your presence O God in your life-giving life. It's amazing. Once you understand sheep and shepherds and David's understanding of them, when you read the Psalms, especially David's Psalms, you, you come across verses like this, and you're like, oh, now that makes sense. You have rescued me from death by keeping my feet from slipping. We picture maybe a sheep falling off the edge of a cliff, and sometimes all it is is your feet slipped and you fell on your back. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. I think there are probably three things that would keep a sheep from, or keep, allow a sheep to fall over more easily. One is just an accident. Sometimes you're just immature in your faith and you find yourself sinning and messing up and doing things you're not supposed to do and be doing. Sometimes it's just that you, a sheep's a little too fat. Seriously, you think about it in your Christian walk, maybe you've gotten a little too confident in who you are in Christ and you're not being careful anymore about who you spend time with. You're not being careful about spending time in God's word. You've gotten a little too big for your, your britches and you're going to find yourself getting cast if you're not careful. And there's also the idea of maybe when a sheep's fleece is too long, it's getting all, when you, we carry too much baggage, we end up finding ourselves stuck on our back. Let's not let that happen. Here's how I want to close. I, I hope that you understand that the Good Shepherd wants rest for you and wants uh, refreshment for you and wants restoration for you. The Good Shepherd provides those things to you. I want to close with one more quote. This is again from that shepherd, Philip Keller. And he's sharing a story about a real sheep and sheep that he'd encountered. It says this, In, in memory... 
I can still see one of the sheep ranches in our district, which was operated by a tenant sheepman. He ought never to have been allowed to keep sheep. His stock were always thin, weak, and riddled with disease and parasites. Again and again they would come and stand at the fence, staring blankly through the woven wire at the green, lush pastures which my flock enjoyed. Had they been able to speak, I'm sure they would have said, Oh, to be set free from this awful owner. He had experienced actual sheep coming up to the fence that separated a, 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 a not good shepherd's flock from his. And he said it was just amazing to see in their eyes how much they wished they could just be on the other side of this fence. Listen, if you are in this room right now, and you are still not under the control and under the guidance and under the love and the protection of the good shepherd, I am not surprised if you are standing feeling weak and and unrested and depraved and like things are falling apart because you don't yet understand the joy of the good shepherd. And for those who are on the right side of the fence... You have all the benefits of the rest and the refreshment and the restoration of a good shepherd in your life. Make sure you're living in that green pasture. Quit trying to whittle your way out and drink out of puddles that weren't meant for you. Let's pray together. God, you are a good shepherd. I'm so thankful for this metaphor and this symbolism because we are so much like sheep. And you are such an incredible shepherd. We ask right now, that you would teach us something from this. If it's, God, that we need to figure out how to rest better, maybe we need to learn how to be refreshed from you. We need to stop drinking out of puddles that you didn't intend for us. God, maybe it is that we, we need to, to learn how to count on you for restoration and, and not give up when we're on our back, but to trust you. I pray that you would be working a truth into our lives and helping it to, to change who we are. God, we all pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Guys, have a great week. We'll see you next week for part two of Psalm 23.